As I'm sure you've guessed over the course of the semester, and I've made mention of this, there certainly are many more microcontrollers than just the PIC 16F887. And one of the things I want you to come away from this course knowing is the benefits of different types of microcontrollers and what you might have opportunity to use throughout your career. Certainly microcontrollers are an evolving technology. There's better and better microcontrollers being developed. So what you're going to learn in this course will largely help you in your entry level, but it is important to practice some lifelong learning and make sure you keep abreast of new technology developments. So what I don't want you to walk away from this course saying is, well, the only microcontroller I could ever use is a PIC 16 f 887 because that's all I know. Um, a lot of what we've talked about is transferable to other technology and other devices. You can learn about C programming and use that with other devices. Certainly the special function registers and exact behavior is going to be different. But you'll, when you're choosing a microcontroller, you want to choose based on several different options. So just know that they come in 8-bit, 16-bit, and 32-bit varieties. So all this semester we've been working with an 8-bit microcontroller. All of our registers are 8 bits long. That has some benefits. Uh, it makes each of the registers fairly simple to configure. But in some cases, we had to have some things that span two different registers to use them. For example, our analog selection. We had more than just eight pins that could be used for analogs. So we had to actually use an Ancel H and an Ancel uh, for the high and the low byte. Uh, same thing when we had results from our analog to digital conversion. We actually had to span across two different special function registers. If you had a 16-bit microcontroller, you could have put both of those in the same one. And with 32 bits, you have even more functionality. Other things you might consider, the number of general purpose input-output pins. So depending upon how many devices you need to interface with, you may not need a microcontroller as big as what we had this semester with 40 pins. Or you might need to interface with even more external devices, so you might need more pins. You might want to consider how many analog channels you're going to need. So the number of A to D pins is something you're going to pay more for. If you need more analog channels, that's going to cost you a little bit more. But if you don't need analog at all, that might not be a priority. Or if you need just a few channels, you might not need as much as we had on this particular pick. You might also consider the memory size you have available, both the RAM and the program memory. So if you're writing very extensive code, the 8192 bytes of program memory that we had on this pick in this class is going to get eaten up rather quickly. Think about if you're trying to write a very detailed robotics program or you're trying to develop a microcontroller system for some automated driving car or something like that. You're going to have a very long program code and so you're going to need more storage space to hold that. Also the RAM size determines how many variables you can have and the types of variables so that is an important consideration as well. In terms of pick selection there's a link here and I'll uh, have you go to that and I'll actually have a separate video on the information that's there um, and that talks about the different types of picks that are available. Microchip has a lot of tools out there to help you choose a microcontroller. Certainly they want you to buy their product. Um, I like the microchip products. They are certainly not the only microcontroller families out there, but all the picks are developed by the microchip company. And so you can actually go to the link you see down on the bottom of your screen and that will help you determine what picks meet your needs. So you can put in things like uh, how many pins, what type of packaging, all those types of things and it will help you select one. So let me go through this overview and then I'll take you to that website a little bit later on. In terms of other companies that are competitors out there, Atmel makes what are called ARM processors, which are perhaps most famous for being used on the Arduinos. Freescale Semiconductor, which actually emerged out of Motorola, is a competitor out there. Infineon does a lot for automotive and manufacturing uh, devices. Parallax, you're probably familiar with if you took the 1016 or 1014 class at ECU because they provide the basic stamp, which is used on our Bobot kits. ST Electronics, Texas Instruments, Toshiba, all make very good microcontrollers. Um, and they have a lot of different options available. So certainly feel free to look around at competitors, see what you have. Um, of course, their architecture is going to be a little bit different. So if you're wanting to use a competitor's device, you're going to have a little bit of a learning curve. But TI especially has some very easy to use, uh, quick to learn 
type uh, programs that you can work with. This is the selection guide Texas Instruments has out. Uh, I suggest you you know try that link out and see what you can find in terms of their options. Here a similar selection guide from Freescale Semiconductor. Certainly play with those links. See what you can find. So here are the basic things you want to consider. Number one is the instruction set. And the real reason that I chose the pick for this class is that it does have a reduced instruction set. Particularly when you're thinking about programming in assembly, we really only had about 35 commands that we had to learn. And so that makes it fairly quick, although with more detailed commands and more options, you certainly can do more things. You might think about what programming language do I need to use and do I understand that language? In this course, we've learned about assembly and C programming in your 1014 or 1016 class. You likely learn PBASIC as you were programming the Parallax Bobot. You might also consider the size. So in this day and age, we're making more and more mobile devices, things people are carrying in their pockets or wearable devices. And you don't want a huge microcontroller hanging off of something that you intend to wear or carry in your pocket. So the smaller you can make things generally better. But if you do need something a little bit bigger and have to have more pins on it, that certainly is a consideration as well. You might also think about pin accessibility. And so what I mean by that is how easy is it to get to those pins? How many pins do you have available to you? So if you're thinking about certain packages, such as surface mount components, it's a little bit harder to access those pins um, if you needed to directly tap on the pins with a... Um, an oscilloscope or a voltmeter, things like that. But once you do have your device fairly well fleshed out in terms of design, it is generally the practice to go towards a surface mount device because it's a much smaller form factor. Surface mount devices look like what you see down here in the bottom right. We've had that on our slides all semester. You also want to consider your power requirements. So if you need this to run off of a particular battery, let's say somebody else is designing a battery for a smartphone and it's your job to design the microcontroller for it, you need to know what kind of power you have available. You need to know whether it's a low current device. You need to know what your voltages are that you have available. You also just really want to think about how do I conserve power? Is this something that's going to be plugged into a wall all day long? Or is this something that's going to run off a of battery and so I need to be a little bit more conscious of power conservation in that case? Also, one of the most important considerations is where are you really going to use this? So what is the typical operating environment? Is this something somebody's going to carry around with them all the time, in which case you might want something a little bit more rugged? Is it something that's going to be exposed to hot or cold temperatures? Is it something inside a refrigerator? Is it something near a very hot industrial process? Is it going to be exposed, exposed to moisture? So is it going to be outside or in a very humid, non-climate controlled environment? Is it going to experience shock? So is it something that somebody's going to run into um, a lot? Or is it going to be dropped? If you want to make things more rugged, there are some microcontrollers that are designed to handle rough environments, high temperatures. So you can put things underneath, say, the engine compartment of a car or inside of a laptop case where it gets quite hot. Um, some things are designed for dropping and those types of things. Certainly the new smartphones that are out now, they're trying to make things um, water resistant and all those. Some of that has to do with packaging, but also in some cases you think about the actual technology inside of the package and how robust it is to the various operating conditions. So here are some examples. This happens to be the same exact chip. This is a 555 timer, but you get the same idea um, in microcontroller circuits. But if you have a dual inline package, it looks like that big form factor you see on the left. That's about the size of an op amp. But when you get into surface mount, this is SOIC packages, which stands for Small Outline Integrated Circuit. It's much smaller. It fits tighter to the board but you lose the flexibility of being able to pull out and swap that microcontroller. So the nice thing about dual inline package is if your microcontroller goes bad, you can easily replace it. Whereas a surface mount, you're going to have to unsolder each of those pins if you want to pull it out of the circuit. And so dual inline package is a great way to go for R&D, but once you do have a finalized design, you're packaging it up and you're assembling it to go out the door. Most 
companies will convert over to surface mount components. Surface mount components are very nice. They are difficult to solder. So when you are soldering, you generally will use uh, certainly a magnifying system, oftentimes a microscope that'll help you to actually do it. But of course, in this day and age, a lot of these processes are automated, so you might have a robotic uh, soldering system that actually puts that in place for you. So that ends the technical matter. I do want to make a brief announcement for your project. One thing is to be careful with the CREN bit. Some of you may have noticed that your data works one time, but it doesn't continuously loop. So what I suggest you do, and I've told a few of you this, I just want to make sure everybody gets the announcement, is to turn off CREN when you're not ready to receive yet. So if you're not quite ready to pull in data off of the wireless broadcast, go ahead and zero out CREN and then just turn it right back on when you're ready to receive the data. Otherwise what happens is you can pull in data before you're expecting it and then if you don't pull it out of RC Reg, then you can actually have a data blockage and that can cause problems. So go ahead and just clear that out, only turn it on when you're ready to receive data and then every time you pull from RC Reg, that'll go ahead and clear your flag and make it so that shift register is available to you. Looking ahead, the remainder of the course, we really only just have one more regular day of class. Um, so Friday is going to be a project work day. I, of course, as I mentioned, will not be there. Um, some of you may be watching this after the Friday class period. On Monday, we meet twice. So we'll have the lecture in the morning. I'm gonna do a course review with you then so I will post a list of topics that will be on the final exam. Feel free to come with any questions you might have about those topics and I'll try to answer them to the best of my ability. And then during your lab period that'll be your final time to work on your semester project. So hopefully everybody will have code to demo to me by 5 o'clock on Monday and I'll check you off that way. Your final reports are due on Friday December 9th at 5 p.m. And that is also when I want you to turn in your trainer kits. So certainly I need to get those back. And so I will just check in everybody's trainer kits as they come back to me. You can just bring those by my office. I should be in my office uh, most of that day, except when you guys are taking the final exam. Speaking of the final exam, both sections have a final exam that starts at 8 in the morning. It's 8 to 10.30 in the morning. If you're in my 10 a.m. Monday, Wednesday, Friday section, you are actually scheduled to take the exam on December 9th. And if you're in my 9 a.m. section, you're scheduled for the last day, December 14th. I do want to extend an option to my 9 a.m. students. If you would like to take the exam early with the students who are in the 10 a.m. section, that way you can get out of town and finish your semester early, you are welcome to take it on Friday, December 9th with the other section. That way I'll just have an opportunity to get some things graded. It's certainly not required. You can take it on the 14th if you want. That'll give you more time to study. But I know some of you like to get out of town as soon as possible. And so if you want to take your exam on December 9th, you are welcome to do that. Please just uh, send me an email if you are planning to take the exam at a different time than what you are assigned. Um, I would prefer that those who are in the 10 a.m. not take it at the later time. Certainly uh, with grades due on Friday the 16th, I want to have as much time as I can to grade your exams. So if you could, uh, as many of you as possible, could take it on the 9th, that would help me in terms of getting your grades done um, in a timely manner. 